So as always, as we've been talking about recently, E is an extension field of F. You want to draw a picture? Yeah, it's slightly helpful, but it certainly doesn't show you everything. F is the base field. E is some extension field of F. F is inside E. That's that's about how helpful that is, is just thinking about that picture. It doesn't really help you a ton more. An automorphism of E is a ring isomorphism from E onto a E, just like an automorphism of a group is a group isomorphism from the group to itself. But with Galois theory, we want those automorphisms to satisfy some other properties. We want those automorphisms to fix elements in the base field. Everything in F should get mapped to itself. We'll come to that here. The Galois group of E over F, gal E slash F, is that a factor ring or a factor group? No, it's just notation. The Galois group of E over F is the set of all automorphisms of E that take every element of F to itself. And this is a group under function composition. Gal E slash F, the Galois group of E over F is a group. They don't prove that here, but it is. If H is a subgroup of the Galois group, then the set of all elements in E, the bigger field, that get mapped to themselves under elements of H is called the fixed field of H. Okay, before we try to prove anything, let's think about examples. So we'll start by working through example one, which we did talk about a little bit the other day. Consider this extension, Q adjoin root two of Q. Say it again, it's all the rationals. It does contain root two. In fact, it's the smallest subfield of the reals containing all the rationals in root two, but there's plenty more numbers in it. As a set, it's this set of numbers, set of all linear combinations really of one and square root of two as the scalars vary over the rationals. It's the span of those two numbers, one and square root of two. Those two numbers are linearly independent over Q. They form a basis for this. This is a two-dimensional vector space over the rationals. I said that fast, but that's something you should feel comfortable thinking about pretty quickly by now. Any automorphism of a field containing Q must act as the identity on Q. Hmm. Exercise one. They want you to take this to the bank I will let you think about it on your own. It is a, a practice problem with a solution key if you want to study this. Any automorphism of a field that is a field extension of the rationals will automatically fix all the rationals. That's probably the original motivation for thinking about such things. It's not obvious, but it is true that if you've got a, an isomorphism from this field to itself, that it's going to fix all the rationals. Again, that's not obvious. Think about exercise one. Look at the solution key if you have to. We're going to take that to the bank and use it here. An automorphism phi of this thing is completely determined by phi of square root of two. You might wonder why. Well, because it's operation preserving and because it fixes all elements of the rationals. If you apply an automorphism to an arbitrary element, a plus b times square root of two of q adjoining root two, the fact that phi is operation preserving with respect to addition means you can write this. And the fact that phi is operation preserving with respect to multiplication means you can write this. And according to exercise one, it must act as the identity on Q, meaning it maps everything, every rational number to itself. This is A and this is B. This is since P acts as the identity 
on the rationals. And well, A and B are rational numbers. You can use that once you've done exercise one, once you've thought it through and you should, you can use this fact anytime you need it. Any automorphism of a field containing the rationals to itself fixes all rational numbers, maps them to themselves. And this equality of these things is why the automorphism is completely determined by the value of phi of square root of two. So then the question is, what is phi of square root of two? Well, use the fact that phi is operation preserving again. Two is phi of two because two is a rational number. Phi of two is two. And two is also square root of two times itself. And phi is operation preserving. That's the same as phi of square root of two quantity squared. In other words, phi of square root of two, whatever it is, has to have a square equal to two. It's gotta be plus or minus square root of two. This automorphism is permuting the roots. I use that word permute on purpose, like permutation. Galois, 200 years ago, was thinking about this stuff. He was thinking about the fact that these automorphisms will permute the roots. They will map them amongst themselves. And you can think of it purely in terms of the, you know, the polynomial x squared minus two. Imagine omega's root of that. Of course, you know omega's got to be plus or minus square root of two. Imagine omega's root of that. So this is true. Apply phi to both sides. Phi of zero is zero. Use the fact that phi is operation preserving. This is phi of omega squared minus phi of two. But that's phi of omega quantity squared minus two because again, phi fixes rational numbers. And what you're saying here is phi of omega satisfies the same kind of equation as omega. Omega squared minus two is zero and so is phi of omega squared minus two. I'm not doing anything differently than the book did right here, essentially. I'm just thinking about it in terms of equations. If omega is a root of this, phi of omega is going to be a root of it. If omega is plus or minus square root of two, so will phi of omega be. I'm doing it this way also because it generalizes to, to more complicated polynomials. This kind of argument generalizes. Automorphisms will permute roots of polynomials because they're operation preserving, doubly operation preserving. So I guess there's only two possibilities. I mentioned these last time. The group Galois, the Galois group of the rationals adjoining root two over Q has two elements, the identity mapping that maps everything to itself and the mapping that sends an arbitrary element to what you might call its conjugate, where you put a minus sign in front of the square root of two part. Kind of like, almost like a complex number, right? It's kind of like the square root of two is acting like an I, and this is complex conjugation. Yeah, it's not that different from it, though these are real numbers instead of complex numbers. So it seems that we could write this. Oops, not ought. I'm so used to writing ought. The Galois group, it is a group of automorphisms, so it was natural to write ought, but in honor of Galois, we write gal. The Galois group of the rationals of joint root two over Q is epsilon comma alpha, where epsilon, epsilon of A plus B root two is a plus b root two, and that'll certainly fix rational numbers, and alpha of a plus b root two is a minus b root two. Probably would be worthwhile for us to take a minute to, to verify that at least alpha is operate, doubly operation preserving, right? We do want this to be an automorphism. 
if I add two elements of the form a rational plus a rational times square root of two and apply alpha, what do I get? Looks like I get a plus c minus b plus d root two, right? Based on the formula for alpha. And what are we trying to show? We're trying to show this equals alpha of this plus alpha of that. Yeah, just do a little rearranging. This is the same as a minus b root two plus c minus d root two. That's alpha of a plus b root two plus alpha of c plus d root two. So alpha preserves addition. Does it preserve multiplication? Give it a try. This is something you should be able to do on the final exam, these kind of calculations. If you're gonna prove it preserves multiplication, you'd wanna actually multiply inside here first. FOIL, the first times first and last times last are the two products that are going to give you things that don't involve square root of two. AC is first times first. Last times last is B times D times two, right? Square root of two squared. Two BD. And the parts that do involve square root of two are going to come from the outside and inside products. A D plus B C square root of two. So I guess we get this when we apply alpha to it. Now apply alpha to both things individually and multiply the results. Do you get the same thing? Yeah, I think I can see it. You're going to end up multiplying a minus b root 2 times c minus d root 2. Once again, the first times first and the last times last are going to give you the parts that don't involve square root of 2. And it will be the same as this. The two minus signs will give you a plus sign. ac plus 2bd. And then for outside times outside and last times last, in both cases, I'll have a minus sign that can be factored out. And yeah, you will get the same thing. So it is doubly operation preserving. Technically speaking, we should show it's one to one and on to as well, but that's pretty easy. Give me an arbitrary element C plus D root, uh, C plus D root two, what gets mapped to it? What will get mapped to it will be C minus D root two. That's enough to verify it's on to is a one to one. If alpha of a plus b root two equals alpha of c plus d root two, that means a minus b root two equals c minus d root two. And the only way that's going to happen is if a equals c and b equals d. Which then implies that the original inputs were the same. I know I'm going quickly. Assuming you can think about these things on your own too. It's good review. Good review for the final to think about what one to one and onto means. Right? Maybe do it again yourself later today. It's not it's not too hard. You just need to think about it carefully. So alpha indeed is an automorphism of q adjoin root two over to, to itself. And it does fix all rational numbers. If, if this is a rational number, it, it means b is zero. So it's gonna map a to itself. So it's a two element group under function composition. It's gotta be isomorphic to z2. It's a very simple group. It's got a very simple subgroup lattice. the entire group and the trivial group. And the index of the trivial subgroup in the entire group is two, right? Number of cosets. 
which is by Lagrange's theorem is going to be the same as the order of this divided by the order of that, which is two divided by one, which is two. So we put a two there. And what the fundamental theorem of Galois theory says, which I, we haven't looked at yet, essentially is you can kind of take this diagram and invert it when you think about fixed fields. What's a fixed field again? If H is a subgroup of the Galois group, the set E sub H, which is the set of everything in the bigger field that gets fixed by everything in H is called the fixed field of H. Everything in H is mapping such elements to themselves, fixing them. The Galois group itself, consisting of epsilon and alpha, looking at these two formulas, what are all the uh, elements of the bigger field, Q adjoining root two, that are fixed by both of these? Well, it's just the rationals. Because if B is non-zero, one of these is going to, well, this one's not going to fix it. B has to be zero for this thing to fix the input. So that's enough to say the fixed field of this thing is the rationals. E, by the way, what, what's capital E? Capital E is just shorthand for Q at joint root two in this example. And the fixed field of just the identity mapping is the entire bigger field Q adjoining root two. It equals E itself. That's the bigger field, this, the smaller field. Likewise, we can think of this as a tower of fields where the degree of this thing over this thing is two. It's a two-dimensional vector space over the rations. The fundamental theorem of Galois theory says you can do this in many more complicated situations. This is about as simple as it gets. As long as the bigger field is a splitting field for a polynomial over the base field, which it is. Q adjoining root two is a splitting field for, we've seen this, f of x equals x squared minus two over the rationals. That's irreducible over the rationals. It's a minimum degree polynomial in which square root of two is a root in which, and this field is a minimal field in which this splits as x minus root two times x plus root two. So as long as this is a splitting field for some polynomial over this, the fundamental theorem of Galois theory is gonna say we can do, make this relationship between the lattice, the subgroup lattice and the subfield lattice, or I more commonly call that a tower of fields. 